teachers didn't get much lead time on this, partly because we don't understand the virus well enough. You know, the, the teachers were told, be ready for this, be ready for that. A week, a week out, oh, by the way, we're, we're, we're going to be hybrid now. Um, no, not surprising that, that there's going to be some fits and starts. Something that we actually did uh, as, a, as a program in educational studies at Rhodes, uh, we, we actually drafted a letter. We sent it around to all of the other EPPs, so educational program providers, to ask them to sign on because hybrid teaching is actually two different and distinct jobs. It is absolutely possible to teach well remotely. Of course it's possible to teach well in person. Asking someone to do both at the same time is a, is a recipe for disaster. That's precisely what we asked most teachers to prepare for. And then we flicked the switch and said, hang on, it's actually gonna be all remote. And there's this kind of like, like relief that comes with, oh, all right, we're not gonna be in person, we're not gonna be at risk of transmission, hang on. Since May, I've been planning on this thing where I'm going to be in the classroom, where I'm going to have students in the classroom, I'm going to have resources, we're going to be doing stuff, I'm going to have a sanitization station for all my manipulatives. Okay, Chuck, all of that, now we're all remote. Had we been able to plan for this since May, I'd actually feel a lot better about remote instruction. And having a daughter-in-law who is a elementary school principal, I've also had that vantage. And they spent a lot of their summer waiting for the decision to occur at the school board level, who were waiting for the decisions to happen uh, at the State Board of Education and from the politicians. And it was a waiting game. And then they were, well, be ready for this and be ready for that. That's easier said than done. I think people forget that they have these things called curricula in schools. There are lesson plans and there are goals and there are exams and they're different ones for remote than in person. Uh, there may be some way to mesh those but you need some lead time to do it and I guarantee you Pearson is not cranking out new curricula for hybrid education and so on. So you've got this curriculum challenge no matter what you decide um, unless you just go full on and in person and even then it's slowed down by you can only go this way on the in this hallway and bathroom situation is different and you got to wash your hands and you got to eat in the classroom and you got to keep the kids in the same pod and they got to keep their masks on and, and did they bring a mask and is it clean and and all of the hygiene things that have always been an issue right? particularly with younger kids and so i think we really underestimate what it was going to require to do it differently I think the other side of this is how we're imagining pedagogy. I've been really frustrated with how we've been imagining higher ed pedagogies, but I think all of this applies to K-12 as well. The idea that if students can see me and hear me, learning is happening is so empty in terms of what our conceptions of, of pedagogy, right? Pedagogy, the art and science of teaching politically or politically conscious teaching and learning. Pedagogy can't happen if I can't actually do things like stay cooperative learning in small group activities in STEM classrooms, right? If we can't share resources and materials to actually be able to perform and do our, our laboratory experiments. Y'all, there's something very, very different about watching a YouTube video six feet apart from everybody with my mask on of like Bunsen burner safety um, or, you know, distillates of water and whatever else we're dropping stuff in there. Watching somebody do that on YouTube is so far removed from what we already have really strong evidence around just thinking about STEM, right? Around inquiry-based and hands-on kinds of STEM activities. The evidence is overwhelming. Doing science is the best way to learn science. The pandemic nullifies that. Um, right? But I, I think as adults, right? If we just think about our own experiences in like lab science moments, you are close, you are intimate, you are in there together, you are working stuff. Um, sometimes I have to look really, really carefully and closely at something. How many levels of disinfectant is needed for the microscope to be used? Should I even be using a microscope? The kinds of things I can do in a classroom, hybrid, even if I'm in person in this kind of COVID pandemic moment, not only does it nullify lots of our curriculum, but it also nullifies many, many, many of our pedagogies. I've been especially frustrated with the way it seems like uh, folks at the decision-making level, the politicians, the policy wonks, at times even district level or university level administrators, imagining as long as students can see and hear the teacher, okay, that's fine, learning's happening. That's all I need to guarantee. That just nullifies so much of what we know about robust learning experiences, both for K-12 and undergrad students. 
And let's talk about the safety side of this as well, because needless to say, teachers are a little bit concerned, uh, not only for themselves, but for the children and for the people that live in the homes that all of these people are going to go back to at the end of the day and come back from. This is a lot of interaction at a time when we've really sort of tried to reduce that in the, in the larger community. Well, what's the justification? Well, children don't get very sick. Do we really know that? It does not appear that they get as sick as elderly people and die as often, but we're still in the early stages of this. Some children have been getting sick. Some have been hospitalized, but let's, you know, the benefit of doubt, um, maybe it's worth the trade-off given what we know scientifically about the risk to kids. But let's look at the risk to adults. These kids go home to adults. They may go home to, to households in which their grandparents live. They may, you know, somebody's doing daycare for them when they go home, whatever. One of the first things you hear is grocery store clerks have to go to their job. They're essential workers. These teachers are just whining. Why don't they just go do their job if they can't take the risks and they should do something else? Let's think about the difference here. You're going to be in a single room with anywhere from 15 to 40 bodies for four, five, six hours. God bless the, the people that work at the grocery stores and the first responders. That's all wonderful. They're doing a public service at a dangerous time. I respect that. This is different. This is different. You're packing people in. Uh, you could have one asymptomatic person super spreading to all of you and then taking that back wherever you're coming from. So let's be, let's be honest. About it. So what's the best we can do? And, and I'm not convinced that all schools are going to be able to do this. You're going to have to work on ventilation. You're going to have to work on hygiene. You're going to have to work on masks, distancing, uh, testing, uh, tracing, pods. All of that needs to be in place. Yes, you can do all these things. It takes a while to get it set up. It costs money. Where's that money going to come from? States and localities are losing money in terms of tax revenues. We're in a recession. 